Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to the Battles of the Bear Christmas War with your host, Bang and Dang, once again. Moving closer and closer and closer. We got about a week in uh, our Civil War timeline until the bat Battles of Gettysburg battle. But before we that, might get to it by... Uh, oh, these are... When's this one getting released? Well, we might get to Gettysburg right, actual, at right the end of around, actual time. Right around the 4th of July. Uh, but either or today, we got five battles. Yes, five. We haven't had a five battler in a while, but... I, like two or three of them are literally just like two port paragraphs. So That's fine. Um, nothing's happening here. Most of them involve Gettysburg, but the first one is um, the Tullahoma campaign in Tennessee. We got Hoover's Gap, Portland Harbor, Second Donaldsonville, Goodrich's Landing, and the Battle of Hanover, all taking place right before uh, Gettysburg with the Battle of Hoover's Gap, first June twenty fourth, eighteen sixty three, which was the principal battle in the Tullahoma campaign. Um, following the Battle of Stones River, Major General William Rosecrans commanded the Union Army. Mm -hmm. Major General William Rosecrans, commanding the Union Army of the Cumberland, remained in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, for over five months in an effort to block further Union progress or progress. Confederate General Braxton Bragg, commander of the Army of the Tennessee, established a fortified line along the Duck River from Shelbyville to War Trace. Braxton Bragg, haven't heard this guy in a while. No, and you won't ever again because uh, he's been erased <laughs> just recently. Well. Is it still Fort Bragg? No, just changed it yesterday. Oh, good for them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to like Fort something. Probably some other racist Union guy. <laughs> you know. Um, well, on he's the Confederate. So. That's what I'm saying. But they probably. Right. Right. Get it. On the Confederate right, infantry and artillery detachments guarded Liberty, Hoover's, <clears throat> and Bell Buckle Gaps through the Highland Rim, which was near Beach Grove, Tennessee. Rosecrans superiors, fearing that Bragg might detach large numbers of men to help break the siege of Vicksburg, urged him to attack the Confederate position. Said, "You need to take these guys out before they go back up uh, Vicksburg." Damn right. <clears throat> One of the Army of the Cumberland Brigade commanders, Colonel John T. Wilder, was impressed by the ability of Confederate General John Hunt Morgan to raid behind Federal lines in Kentucky. He was like, "That was pretty impressive." When he found that Rosecrans wanted to increase the strength of his mounted force while they proposed to mount his infantry brigade by launching raids of the surrounding countryside to steal horses. Oh, no, you can't be a horse thief. Well, you get killed for that. Yeah. Well, Rosecrans, he's like, go ahead, bud. You can't get killed for it when the military right. is giving you permission. It's like, we're the government. We can do what we want. Mm -hmm. By the middle of April 1863, Wilder's brigade was fully mounted. Look at that. Look at that shit. Have you witnessed a demonstration of a new repeating rifle? By Christopher Minor Spencer in March, while they're determined to arm his brigade with that weapon. Oh, damn, dude, once they got yeah, those. We got a guy commanding his own brigade, taking shit in his own hands. Right. Instead gave, of the army. Gave all his guys repeating rifles. Oh, no, that's well, a game changer. Well, they paid for him, as you'll see here. Wilder got his soldiers wholehearted support to rearm them with the Spencer repeating rifle, and each soldier pledged a note for 35 bucks. Hey, whatever. With notes in hand, Wilder co-signed them and took out a loan from his hometown banks. Soon the brigade was armed with the new seven-shot repeaters and began Damn. performing spirited mounted service. Dude. June 23rd, 1863, Rosecrans deployed forces to feign an attack on Shelbyville while massing forces against Bragg's right. Union troops struck out a cor uh, towards the gaps, and on June 24th, Major General George Thomas's men, spearheaded by Colonel Wilder's Lightning Brigade, attacked Hoover's Gap. I mean, that damn lemon tree in Shelbyville, dude. Everybody wants it. Crazy. It's true. Wilder's mounted infantry pushed ahead and reached the gap nearly nine mile ahead of uh, nine miles ahead of Thomas's main body. Wilder's men were armed with new Spencer repeating rifles, and they attacked. The Confederate First Kentucky Cavalry converged with the Third Kentucky Cavalry under Colonel J. Russell Butler was easily pushed aside. And they're like, Pff, look what we got, right? Pew 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 oh, pew foes. pew. As Butler's unit fell back, the entire seven mile. Uh, length of the Hoover's Gap, Hoover's Gap, it ran into Brigadier General William B. Bates' brigade of Major General Alexander Stewart's division. They're like, dude. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go out there. <laughs> they got some weird weapons. <laughs> Had been reported to Wilder that Bates' brigade defended the top of the gap, but he found the summit unoccupied and his soldiers could see Bates' camps in the valley below. Wilder dismounted his troops and prepared to hold the gap despite orders from his division commander, Major General Joseph Reynolds, who told him to retreat. Uh -oh. Wilder entrenched on the hill south of the Gap and determined to hold this extremely advanced position. 
Bates' brigade counterattacked throughout the day, but could not dislodge them. Ooh, man, they got a battle going on there. When he received orders to fall back through the gap, Wilder refused, claiming he had to hold his ground. Meanwhile, Brigadier General Bushrod Johnson's brigade, they arrived, and now Bate and Johnson plan a final attack on Wilder. This attack was also repulsed by 7 p.m. Units from Lavelle Russo and John M. Brandon's division of Thomas's court arrived at the gap. And they're like, let's do this shit. When Wilder saw Generals Rosecrans and Thomas riding up to his position, he expected to be chastised for ignoring the orders was to, to withdraw. But to his surprise, instead, he rode to Rosecrans and explained. Not to his surprise. No, <laughs> no but he was like, screw this. I'm going to ride right up to him and explain it. He said, I'm going to explain to him that I disobeyed orders because I know that my soldiers are capable of holding the gap. Well, surprising to him, <laughs> right. Rosecrans was thrilled and shook Wilder's hand saying, thank you, God. Thank God for your decision. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> he says it would have cost us 2,000 lives to have taken this position if you had given up. Oh, man. Just then, Reynolds arrived. Before he could say a word, Rosecrans told him, Wilder has done right. Promote him. The Federals inflicted 146 casualties on the Confederates while sustaining only 61. Just before noon, June 26th, Stewart sent a message to Johnson and Bate, stating he was pulling back, and they should, too. Yeah, but, like, yeah, it's not working out, guys. Right. Although slowed by rain, Rosecrans moved on, forcing Bragg to retreat from his defensive line and fall back to Tullahoma. After reaching there, Rosecrans sent Wilder's Lightning Brigade ahead to hit the railroad in Bragg's rear. Arriving too late to destroy the Elk River Railroad Bridge, the Federals destroyed a railroad track around Detchard instead. I mean, whatever. As long as you got the track somewhere. Right. I would assume a track would be way easier to repair than a bridge, though. Yeah, I'd say. Bragg evacuated his forces from Middle Tennessee and withdrew to the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Rosecrans followed and captured that city on September 8, 1863, which we will get to. We will. Maneuvering them continued in the Chickamauga campaign. Rosecrans was frustrated that the victory at Hoover's Gap at and the Tullahoma campaign were overshadowed by two other Union victories of the summer of 1863, the Siege of Vicksburg and the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, come on, Rosecrans. <laughs> you, can't be, you can't be all salty about those. Two, two of the ten going. biggest battles oh, ever. Right. Most famous, for sure. Right. Get the Hank Hill out of here. Come on, Rosecrans. Nobody, nobody is going to mention uh, <clears throat> the Battle of Hoover's Gap <laughs> and the Compared to those two. Wow. Jeez. How many casualties? We even get no casualty numbers on that. Yeah, it was 61 for us and 146 for Confederates. Um, which moves us to the Battle of Portland the Harbor. Bus. The Union, oh. obviously. Who says that we support the Union? <laughs> well, we are the Union now. So or the Confederate. We are the Federals. That's true. Who's, who said they even supported any of those two? Well, the Battle of Portland Harbor is next, which was an incident, quote unquote, right. in June of 1863 in the waters off of Portland, Maine. Oh, we got a little uh, naval battle, huh? Well, not quite. Around June 24th, a Confederate raider named Raider Boat named the Tacone, commanded by Lieutenant Charles Reed, uh, was being pursued by the Union Navy. <laughs> to thwart their pursuers, at about 2 a.m. on June 25th, the Confederates captured the Archer. Which is a main fishing schooner out of Southport. Okay. After transferring their supplies and cargo onto Archer, the Confederates set fire to the to the Tacone, and hoping the Union Navy would believe the ship was destroyed and leave them alone. Dang, they're going on, on up to Maine. It's crazy. Twenty sixth of June, eighteen sixty three, a Confederate raiding party entered the harbor at Portland late in the evening, sailing past Portland headlight. The rebels uh, disguised themselves as fishermen's. They planned to try to destroy the area's commercial shipping capability and then to escape out of the harbor. When the raiders left the port area on the 27th of June, they proceeded to the Federal Wharf. Cool. Having the advantage of surprise, the crew seized that cutter belonging to the Revenue Service, the USRC Caleb Cushing, named for a Massachusetts congressman, United States Attorney General, and Minister to Spain. Oh, look at this guy. Goes up a little, little revenue boat. All right. The original intent was to seize the side wheel steamer Chesapeake, but its boilers were cold. Yeah, you can't just heat up a uh, steamship. No. Um, as they would lose too much time in getting the steam up, they took the cushion instead. Mm -hmm. They escaped and sailed out to sea. No, news spread of the Confederate actions and the army of garrison at Fort Preble in nearby South Portland was alerted to the rebel intrusion. The Confederates had been observed by several persons while taken over the cutter, and public fury was aroused. Why didn't nobody say anything right. when they were doing it? 30 soldiers from Fort Prebo were assigned to pursue the raiders, and they took a 6-pound field piece and a 12-pound howitzer with them. Accompanied by about 100 civilian volunteers, the soldiers commandeered the steamer Forest City, which is a side-wheel excursion ship, and the Chesapeake, whose steam was finally up. 
All the civilians on board were issued muskets ooh, to defend against the Confederates. Oh, and then you get these guys. <laughs> Four City, the faster ship, was the first to catch up to Cushing and Archer. Cushing opened fire on Four City when it came within two miles. The captain of Four City was afraid to pursue any further. Cushing, being a revenue cutter, had two secret compartments hidden in the captain's stateroom. Confederate Lieutenant Reed had not discovered the cache of powder and ammo stored there. Oh, man, that would have been good for them if he did. If he had, the outcome could have been very different. All right. Oh, wow. Had some stuff there. Huh? How do you not, like, look, you know, you always got to hide shit. Well, the Chesapeake, which had left port sometime after Four City with Portland's Mayor Jacob McClellan in command, wow. finally caught up and continued on toward Cushing. The wind was beginning to blow against the Confederate sailors, and the steamer soon caught sight of the Cushing. Reed. So, so would it be Captain Mayor or Mayor Captain Jacob? Captain McClellan? Not even Mayor anymore? Captain Mayor? Captain Mayor. Mayor Captain? Mayor Captain. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> Reed, who was a Confederate lieutenant, ordered Cushing torched. Oh, its man. munitions exploded after the ship was abandoned by her 24 crewmen who escaped in lifeboats. <laughs> okay. They surrendered to Mayor McClellan, McClellan and were held as prisoners of war at Fort Preble. Mm, apparently, oh, he was mayor at the fort. He was captain. All right. Know. Archer was also soon captured, and all the rebels were returned to Portland. Hmm. It was discovered that the Confederates were in possession of over $100,000 in bonds, which were to be paid after the Treaty for Peace was ratified between the North and South, supposedly. Nah. They were hoping, anyways. All right. Public anger against the Southerners were very high. Well, isn't it already? And the city requested additional troops to safeguard the prisoners. When they were to be transported to Boston in July, the men who had uh, who had to be spirited out of Portland during the night to prevent a riot from breaking out, pitchforks and flames, you know, like you ever seen The Simpsons or something. Right. <sighs> or any mob scene. Or have you ever seen Edward Scissorhands? <laughs> <laughs> And they really did come like that, too. They were removed to Boston Harbor and held at Fort Warren. They're like, we got to get you guys out of here. Good for them. Not really a battle, I guess, but mm. it happened. They tried. They're uh, trying to outsmarting them. Didn't happen. Because then they had to escape in lifeboats. Good, Stupid. I'd burn the boat that was clearly going to go faster than the lifeboats anyways, idiots. <laughs> That's dumb. Jeez. Well, moves us on to the second battle of Donaldsonville, which we clearly already covered the first, which took place June 28th in Ascension Parish, Louisiana. 28th of June. Confederate Brigadier General John Alfred Mooton ordered Brigadier General Tom Green, my bum is on your lips, hey. and Colonel James Patrick Major's brigades to take Donaldsonville, Louisiana. The Union had built Fort Butler, which the rebels had to take before occupying the town. Uh, their forces were the Fort Butler Garrison, two companies of the 28th Maine Volunteer Infantry, and some convalescents from various mm. regiments. Mm. The Confederate forces were Tom Green's Texas Brigade and Colonel James Patrick Major's Texas Brigade as well. Night of... 27th of June, 1863. Green, within a mile and a half of the fort, began moving troops ahead to attack. The attack started uh, soon after midnight. Well, night fighting, huh? And the Confederates quickly surrounded the fort and began passing through the various obstructions. Those troops attacking along the levee came to a ditch, unknown to them, too wide to cross. And that saved the day for the Union garrison. So a moat, <laughs> pretty much. A Union gunboat, USS Princess Royal, came to the garrison's aid, also and began shelling the attackers. Look at the United States still loving Britain. Right. Feudal Confederate assaults continued for some time, but they eventually ceased their operations, and then they retired. This point on, the Mississippi River remained in Union hands, and many other Mississippi River towns were occupied by the Yanks. The Confederates could harass but not eliminate these Union en enclaves. Yep. yep. Dude, once like uh, Mississippi's uh, gone. Once they came into Baton Rouge, dude, it was over, and then started working. I mean, once they came into Baton Rouge, the Confederates, oh. Confederates were, should have been like, we need to focus on the river, New Orleans, right? Because New Orleans is right at the port, right? But once that happened, the Confederates should have been like, all right, look, we need to start from the northern Louisiana and go all the way up to Tennessee. You would think. And just guard the shit out of all these. But at the same time, they also had to protect their capital. That's very true. I mean, what's the capital that important? They could have just set up a capital somewhere else. Right. Especially the Confederates. Right. Washington would have been a little bit more hard, right. but once that capital's gone, your hopes are ended. That's the capital. Well, not true. War of 1812, they took over. Yeah, but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't occupy it. They, they just burned it the down. house down. <laughs> That's right. They burned it down and got the hell out of there. 
Well, leads us to fourth battle of the day, the Battle of Goodrich's Landing in Louisiana as well, which was fought on June 29th and June 30th. Goodrich's Landing was a cotton plantation owned by Henry Goodrich of East Peril Parish, East Carroll Parish, situated on a west bank of the Mississippi River. The Landing served as a shipping point for area cotton planters. When Union forces invaded the region in early 1862, they seized the plantation and established it as a base of operations in their advance against Vicksburg. Oh. Hundreds of escaped slaves flocked to the Union camp. Neighboring plantation owners abandoned their properties. They're like, we can't live next to these guys. <laughs> and they evacuated to the West into Confederate-held territory. Oh, shit. Look at that. The United States government subsequently confiscated these properties. Hell, yeah. Leased them to northern entrepreneurs who employed former slaves to grow cotton. They're like, hey, slaves, <laughs> we want you to still pick the cotton for us, but, but we'll, we'll pay you at least. Supposedly, we'll right. pay you. I was a penny a day. Right. By the summer of 1863, Union forces under the command of General U.S. Grant. Ulysses Grant. Ulysses something right. Grant. Ulysses Salvador. I don't know. <laughs> uh, they had surrounded and besieged the city of Vicksburg. Yes, they have. Confederate troops in Louisiana and Arkansas believed that by raiding Goodrich's Landing, they could disrupt Grant's supply chain and relieve their compatriots at Pittsburgh. Didn't they learn against that uh, at Milliken's Bend when they tried right. to do the same thing and didn't work? Like Providence. Right. Uh, June 1863, Confederates from Gaines's Landing, Arkansas, undertook an expedition to Lake Providence, Louisiana. Oh, Lake Providence. Mm-hmm. In an effort to disrupt the Union bet. assault. The Union had constructed fortifications on top of an old Indian mound about five miles northwest of Goodrich's Landing, guarding a military supply depot. Confederates planned to attack the fort on June 29th, but decided to demand an unconditional surrender first, which obviously not going to work. Never Whoa. Happens. Which the Union forces accepted. Wow. That never happens. Later in the day, Confederate Colonel William Parsons encountered companies of the 1st Kansas Mounted Infantry and routed them. Dang. Damn, really? Union's like, all oh, right. it's just a military supply depot right. that surrendered. Yeah, they got like, yeah, we ain't doing shit. Hmm. Do what you do, man. The Confederates then seized Union Army supplies stored at the landing, began burning cotton in the surrounding plantations. The governor of Louisiana had issued orders for all cotton crops within the state to be destroyed, thereby keeping it out of Union hands. You know, any cotton you come across. Gone. By the next morning, United States naval boats had landed at the Mississippi Marine Brigade under the command of Brigadier General Alfred E. Ellett. At Goodrich Landing, this is where they were going to go. Well, that's where they are. At dawn, he set out with Colonel William F. Wood's black troops to find the Confederate raiders. we got to get these raiders. Yeah. Ellett's cavalry encountered the enemy first and began skirmishing. The fight became more intense as Woods' forces approached. Parsons eventually disengaged and fell back, taking his captured supplies with him. Although the Confederate expedition was successful, having disrupted Union operations and captured much-needed supplies, the raid, raid failed in its primary objective, which was to divert Union attention from the siege at Vicksburg. Yeah. They're not going to take. They're not just going to leave Vicksburg to go with this. They're not going to do anything like that. What are you guys thinking of? Well, that was pointless. Moving on to the Battle of Hanover, which is the biggest battle of this episode, and it took place on the thirtieth of June, eighteen sixty-three. In Hanover, of course, southwestern York County, Pennsylvania. As part of the Gettysburg Campaign, Robert E. Lee moved his Northern Army of Virginia northward in 16, I mean 16, in June of 1860 through the Shenandoah Valley towards Pennsylvania. Ports of his cavalry, portions of his cavalry under Jeb Stuart, slipped eastward across the paths of the Union Army of Potomac. A series of raids in eastern Maryland netted prisoners and supplies as well as disrupting federal communications and telegraph lines. Uh, however, though, Stuart was not in a position to effectively screen Lee's advance or to provide intelligence on the movements of the Federal Army. What are you there for? He's screwing up big time. Right. As Stuart headed north in an effort to link with Lee, Union Cavalry Commander Major General Alfred Pleasanton, riding towards Pennsylvania to the west of Stuart, ordered his divisions to fan out across a wide swath, keeping an eye out for the ribs. <laughs> Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick's division was on the Union right flank. The majority of his men passed through Hanover early in the morning of June 30th, pausing briefly for refreshments and to receive greetings of the jubilant townspeople. Oh, well, the townspeople, they're like, man, our town was just raided three days ago. <laughs> Where in hell were you guys at then? Right. Confederate Lieutenant Colonel Colonel uh, Elijah White's cavalry attached to Major General Jubal Early's. Hey, we're having that guy. Div- oh, he'll play a pretty big part coming up in uh, 1864. Well, they're attached to Early's division that had occupied uh, York County. White's Virginians and Marylanders had followed the railroad to Hanover from nearby Gettysburg. Damn, the Confederates had a Maryland uh, regiment thing? That's crazy. And taking horses, food, supplies, clothing, 
shoes, and other desired items from the townspeople. They're like, we want it all. We want this uh, handkerchief. Often paying with valueless Confederate money or drafts on a Confederate government. They're like, we give you this. What the hell am I going to do with that? I'll take pesos. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> White's raiders had destroyed the area's telegraph wires, cutting off communications with the outside world before sacking the nearby Hanover Junction train station. The unexpected arrival of Kilpatrick's columns from the north was a pleasant surprise to the residents of Hanover, who warmly greeted the Union soldiers with food and drink. What we got left. Right. Well, most of Kilpatrick's men remounted and passed through town, heading northward towards the nearby Pigeon Hills towards Abbottstown. He left behind a small rear guard to force... Uh, a small rear guard force to pick up the road south and west of Hanover. In the meantime, Stuart had left his billet at Shrivers Corner in Maryland and was proceeding northward across the Mason-Dixon line into Pennsylvania. Hearing that Federal Cavalry has been spotted near his intended destination, which was Littlestown, Pennsylvania, he instead turned towards Hanover in adjacent York County. Oh. His progress was slowed considerably by a cumbersome train of over 125 heavily laden supply wagons that he captured near... Oh, it's his train hmm. that he captured near Rockville, Maryland. In addition, he had skirmished with Delaware Cavalry on June 29th at Westminster, Maryland, further delaying him. This dude's always getting delayed. Right. Shortly before 10 a.m. He's got 125 cars of uh, supplies and shit that he right. took, though? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty sweet. Shortly before 10 a.m. on the 30th of June, 1863, the rear guard of the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry encountered Confederate videttes about three miles southwest of Hanover at Gitz Mill. In ensuing exchange of small arms fire, a Confederate cavalryman died and several were wounded. Shortly afterwards, 25 men from Company G of the 18th Pennsylvania were captured by the 13th Virginia from John Chambliss' brigade, the vanguard of Stewart's oncoming cavalry. Also that morning, a series of minor engagements occurred near Littlestown and elsewhere along Stewart's path. And elsewhere. And elsewhere. And others. And others. <laughs> um, southwest of Hanover at a tiny hamlet now known as Penville. The second North Carolina Cavalry struck the 18th Pennsylvania's main column and split it in two. Union survivors retired in disorder through the streets of Hanover just as Stewart's horse artillery arrived, unlimbered, and opened fire. As the Confederates occupied the town in the wake of the fleeing Pennsylvanians, General Farnsworth wheeled the 5th New York Cavalry into position near the town's commons and attacked the rebel flank in the streets, forcing the Tar Heels to abandon their brief hold on the town. Oh. The commander of the... Oh, so when are they going to change that? All right. The commander of the 2nd North Carolina, William Henry Fitzhugh Payne, was captured under or after his dying horse pitched him into a nearby Aww. tanning bath. A Union soldier pulled Payne out and took him prisoner. Yeah, but as more of Chamber, right? right? It was it oh. pitched him into a nearby tanning vat. What's a tanning vat? So it's like the uh, stuff they use to tan and uh, raw hide and stuff like that. Right. That sucks, poor guy. <sighs> now he's got to look like a, right. like a piece, piece of piece leather. Of leather. <laughs> As more of Chambliss's men and General Stewart arrived on the scene, they were met by additional Federals near the sprawling Carl Forney farm, just uh, south of Hanover. Nearly surrounded in the confused fighting, Stewart and a staff officer made their escape cross-country through the hedges bordering the county line. The country lane. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, leaping their horses over a 15-foot wide ditch. Damn, you're like right. To see that. Maybe, though. <laughs> that horse was scared, too. You know, I'd make that jump. <laughs> Hearing the unmistakable sound of distant gunfire, Judson Kilpatrick raced towards uh, Hanover with his horse dying in the town square from the server's ride. Oh, man. He was like, dude, you just killed me. From, from the severe ride. <laughs> from the server's ride. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the young general began to deploy his men in and around Hanover, barricading some streets with barrels, okay, farm wagons, dry goods, boxes, and anything else that might provide cover. Yeah, because back then. That big ass crates. Right. Uh, dry goods were coming in. Mm -hmm. um, shortly before noon, fighting at the Forney Farm seized as the rebels broke off contact. Kilpatrick positioned Custer's, that Custer, yeah, newly arrived, I think, right? Maybe. Um, his newly arrived brigade on the farm and awaited developments. When Fitzhugh Lee's Virginia brigade arrived, Stewart moved his and Chambliss's men into a new position on a ridge extending from the Keller Farm southwest of Hanover to Mount Olivet Cemetery southeast of town. It's like 70,000 miles. Mount Olivet cemeteries in America. Everywhere, dude. It's ridiculous. Meantime, Kilpatrick repositioned the brigades of the newly promoted duo of Custer and Farnsworth. Uh, he Attorneys did that. He's at law. All right. He did that to form a better defensive perimeter and then brought up his guns. Leaving the captured wagons two miles south of town under heavy guard, Wade Hapton and at 2 p.m. brought his brigade and Breathhead's battery into position near the Mount Olivet Cemetery on the extreme right of Stewart's line. 
An artillery duel ensued for better part of two hours. As opposing cannons hurled shells over the town, fragments blasted holes in several houses, narrowly missing, uh, missed killing Mrs. Henry Weinbrenner. Oh, man, you don't want to do that. And her very own daughter, who had just left their balcony when a projectile came hurling towards them. Through the upstairs. Yeah. During a prolonged artillery exchange, Custer's dismounted 6 Michigan moved forward to within 300 yards of Chambliss and the two guns supporting his line. Flanked and losing 15 men as prisoners, the Wolverines tried again and succeeded at securing the little town Frederick Road, which opened a line of communication with the Union 12th Corps. Stewart and Kilpatrick made no further aggressive moves, and both sides initiated a series of skirmishes and minor probing actions. Disengaging slowly and protecting his captured wagons, Jeb Old Stewart withdrew to the northeast through Jefferson towards York, known from recent newspapers to be the location of Early's division. En route, Stewart heard at New Salem that Early's division had recently left York and marched northwestly through Dover. Stewart changed course and headed northward through the night on winding, hilly country roads, still trying to locate Early or even Lieutenant Richard Ewell, thinking that Ewell would still be towards the Susquehanna River. He's like, Ewell should be still by the Sus- 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 Susquehanna. <laughs> Somewhere around there. Well, the head of, the head of Stewart's 17-mile-long column arrived in Dover at 2 a.m., 17-mile long. Dude, that's ridiculous. Holy shit. Uh, they arrived in Dover at 2 a.m. on the morning of July 1st with the rear guard there by 8 a.m. Holy shit, dude. It took another six hours just for the rest of his shit to get there. Wow. Stewart learned, how the hell do you even know what's going on in your back? Right. Holy 17 shit. 17 miles back. Stewart learned that early had passed through town and was heading westward. to <laughs> just <laughs> Oh, my. Hey. Leave some of your guys there and go find right. them. Send a telegram. This is where we are now. Right. Jeez. Um, he learned that early at passed through town and was heading westward towards Shippingsburg as the army concentrated. Stewart paroled over 200 Union prisoners and gave his troopers a much-needed six-hour rest. While unknown to Stewart, Major General Henry Hess, Confederate Infantry Division. <laughs> uh, Major General Henry Hess, Confederate Infantry Division, collided with Brigadier General John Buford's Union Cavalry at Gettysburg. Stewart resumed his exhausting march through the afternoon and early evening, seizing over a thousand fresh horses from York County farmers. Dicks. I guess unless he left left them theirs. True. Leaving Hampton's brigade in the wagons at Dillsburg, Stewart headed for Carlisle, hoping to find Ewell. (laughs) (laughs) Instead, Stewart found nearly 3,000 Pennsylvania and New York militia occupying the borough. (laughs) After lobbing a few shells into the town during early evening and burning Carlisle barracks, Stewart withdrew after midnight to the south towards Gettysburg. The fighting at Hanover, long march through York County with the captured wagons, and the brief encounter at Carlisle slowed Stuart down considerably he, uh, for his attempt to rejoin the main army and locate Lee, which he's just trying to find these guys everywhere. It's not, how do you not even know? The eyes and ears of the, arm, the Army of Northern Virginia had failed Robert E. Lee. Once again. Losses at Hanover were relatively light in terms of casualties, but the cost and time delay in Stuart from Lincoln with Lee proved to be even more costly. Estimates vary as to the number of men lost at Hanover, which the Union losses in one source are listed as 19 killed, 73 wounded, 123 missing. For a total of 215, the 18th Pennsylvania had suffered the most with three men killed, 24 wounded, and 57 missing. Damn. On the Confederate side, Stuart's losses are generally estimated as 9 dead, 50 wounded, 58 missing for a total of 117. Mm. He was messing these Union guys up, though. I guess so. The fight in Hanover is commemorated by the Picket, an impressive bronze statue of a mounted cavalryman. I didn't think they tried taking that down or it's, did take it down. It commemorates all of the unnamed cavalrymen whose names have been lost to history. The fight in Hanover commemorated by the Picket, an impressive bronze statue of a mounted cavalryman sculpted by famed Boston artist Cyrus E. Dolan, paid for by the state of Pennsylvania. It was erected in 1905. In the center of a square. <laughs> no, at the town square. Two bronze plaques installed by the federal government in 1901 bear inscriptions relating to the movements of the Army of the Potomac on the 30th of June and the 1st of July in 1863. In addition, a small number of artillery pieces are located on the town square as well, including serial number one of the Parrot Rifle, the original barrel, mounted on a reproduction carriage. That's awesome. No way. That'd be awesome. So the first ever Parrot Rifle? All right. A wall plaque on a modern building and a star surrounded by four horseshoes installed in the sidewalk marked the location of Custer's headquarters and the Custer maple, a prominent tree used by the boy general to tether his horse. Oh, cute. Oh, the boy general. The boy general. 
2005, the borough erected mm-hmm. <laughs> over a dozen wayside markers at key spots <laughs> along the city streets to help interpret the battle for visitors. And three years later, the state added its own markers as part of the Pennsylvania Civil War Trails Initiative. However, much of the open areas south of town, including the Forney Farm, where Custard Advance has been lost to modern development. As has the once open hills a half mile north of Hanover Center Square, where Kilpatrick's artillery deployed. Elder's Battery of Four Cannons was deployed along what is now Stock Street east of Carlisle Street, and Pennington's Battery was deployed along what is now 4th Street west of Carlisle Street. The York County History Center and some local Hanover organizations sponsor guided tours of the sites. So go there to uh, York County and visit the battle sites, even though there's clearly not much done. There's nothing. Like, you're walking down a street, and there's, like, like a Rite Aid or something. There yeah, was uh, uh, Kilpatrick's yeah, guys. Yeah, here's the battle site for... What, what was that one? It's McDonald's. Yeah, not too much longer, or too much... No. Not too long ago, where the site of the battle was, like, a Shell gas station or right. some shit. Yeah. Now, no. I'm like, so sad. Whatever, dude. <laughs> I mean, they could. that could be a tourism spot. They're idiots. They're dumb. If I was running that Shell, you put a bunch of memorabilia in there, right. and... Stupids. This is going to do it for this episode of, that was Hoover's Gap, Sport Lane Harbor, 2nd Donaldsonville, Good Riches Landing, and Hanover, which means since the Good Riches Landing took place July 1st, and we know that Gettysburg is July 3rd, 1st through the 4th, or through the 3rd, I mean. Oh, yeah. Bum, Almost, because we, before the Battle of Gettysburg, we will have the Battle of, well, the Battle of Hanover is June 30th, my bad. We'll have the Battle of Sporting Hill in Pennsylvania on J- June 30th. July 1st is the Battle of Car Isle. And the uh, first to the second is the Battle of Cabin Creek. That'll be all next episode. Uh-oh. The first two are um, pretty much begins the ba- uh, Battle of Gettysburg. And then the Battle of Cabin Creek is in Oklahoma. And we're finding the engines over there. Oh, engines. <laughs> and then the week after next, the episode after next, will be the Battle of Gettysburg, which... Mm. Prepare for a long episode on that one because it's going to be a big one. Positions here at the third mile and fifth tree there. and Oh, my. It's going to be so stupid. Uh, Northwest Cordile. This is before everything's blown up. Oh, yeah. This is going to be a good hour and a half for show. Um, good. We need an episode. We haven't had a good, long, nice episode since mm. Vicksburg. Mm. <laughs> that was only like 45 minutes. Right. Gettysburg going to be way longer than that one. Right. And then after Gettysburg, we got coming up. Uh, a few more spots in the area of Gettysburg, Hunterstown, Fairfield. Then we go to Kentucky for Tebbs Bend, and we don't have another major, major battle all the way up until the Battle of Chickamauga on September 19th through the 20th in Georgia. Georgia! Which, uh, is that one even big? Decent size one. It's probably going to be about the size of Gettysburg. Looking at this. Oh, shit. No more. Yeah. So... Big one. Good one. That do for us. Right now on our other podcast, Outlaws and Gunslingers, we are in the middle of covering the Mafia. We're at the early stages. I think by the time you guys hear this episode, we'll be covering the commission. This week's episode will be about the commission formed by Lucky Luciano and pretty much set the stage for the modern Mafia. Well, still something they uh, continue to uh, do right now as we speak. They're they might be holding a meeting right now. You never know. Never, you never know. know, but go check that out. Outlaws and Gunslingers podcast. You can type that in Google and show up everywhere. 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 And other than that, we got about two weeks or two episodes more to go on uh, This Week in Sports History, and then we're done with that. And then we have a new show that we're coming out with shortly. Well, probably the right the next week after that one ends because um, we're stupid and... <laughs> We think we need to do seven million different kind of podcasts, but uh, we're doing it anyways. But we have well now it's when it gets closer. We got about two, <laughs> two, three, five about a month before that debut. It'll be so good. It'll, be good. <laughs> it'll be good. So we'll see you then. We'll see you next week for another three battles here on the Battles of the American Civil War. We are the Mother Michigan. Dang.